We have just a couple of minutes before the live stream starts. Uh, so, well, I think actually the live stream has maybe started, but we have a couple of minutes before 6.30. If, if some of you don't have the book, the, the book that we used last week that if you didn't have it, you were totally confused. We've got uh, a half a dozen more copies over here. Hello. How are you doing? You, you don't need the book? Hey, Jim. Here we go. Hey, how are you? Good to have you here. Yeah, you were here last week, right? No, okay. Yeah, good. You got it? Everybody got it? Everybody got it? We welcome you tonight. Uh, uh, several of you, uh, no doubt, live streamed last week and were frustrated because you didn't have the the document in front of you. And uh, my apologies for that. We we quickly corrected that and got it on the website so that you could get it from Synod's office if you wanted to. And then you had to have 60 pages in your printer to to run it off. So. Uh, we made another 20 copies, and I think there's one or two left over there. Uh, but we'll make more if uh, needed, and, and tonight at least, if you're present here, uh, you know, share even if we run out of copies. Because uh, it really is vital. That's what we're going through. We're studying this document from the Commission on Theology and Church Relations. Now, for those of you who are streaming uh, tonight with us, uh, hopefully you were here in person last week and you already have it. Uh, if you need that document, and we know that there are some of you in four states that are streaming with us, uh, so I encourage you to use the link that we have on our St. Paul webpage and go to the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod website and uh, use that link and you'll be able to download digitally unless you wanted to print it off at 60 pages, but uh, we're honored that you're with us uh, tonight from all over the country. Uh, and so we're glad to pick it up this week uh, after we kind of laid some foundations last week, some, some primary talk about the whole matter of how culture is drifting uh, further and further towards uh, everybody determining how they want to die and uh, the complications that, are, that that brings, especially with the amazingly wonderful medical technology. So that, you know, from the time that the original documents by our synod were written uh, 40 years ago, uh, there's so much more technology that is available for us to at the, end, at the time of the end of life. And so it really is a complicated issue, and I'm so proud our church has uh, created this document, rewritten the previous documents, and uh, tonight we will uh, pick it up after, uh, well, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of review on the theological issues that we covered last week. And then we're going to get into, uh, if you uh, want to look at the table of contents, uh, we're going to get into uh, section three tonight. Uh, ventilators, who decides, advanced directives, when is enough enough, refusing or withdrawing treatment, financial matters, uh, all kinds of uh, terminology. Uh, what's the difference between palliative care and palliative sedation? And uh, when should treatments be refused? And what about vegetative state? And uh, you know, how do we know what's best? Oh, okay. So with that as a, as a bit of an introduction, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Lord of the church, God of our salvation, creator of life. 
Uh, we praise you and thank you tonight that you not only created us uh, in your image, that you gave us not only a material dimension, organs and blood vessels and, and skeletons, but you gave us a soul. You gave us the privilege of being in a relationship with our Creator. And we praise you, O Lord, that when that went wrong and when death came upon the scene as a result of sin, when suffering entered life, and we have uh, all kinds of issues uh, over and against us, that you sent your son Jesus to give meaning and purpose to not only life, but even to suffering and certainly to overcome death. And so we praise you as we gather together tonight here in this room and uh, over the uh, live stream that's going on, and we just ask uh, wisdom and comfort and uh, encouragement for, uh, for life in this world, uh, especially this world that's moving further and further away from you. Help us to stand up for the truth always, in Jesus' name, amen. The other document that is at your place tonight uh, is, is what I promised to give you uh, last week uh, and uh, why the document from the Commission on Theology and Church Relations uses this phrase, always to care, never to kill. And uh, it comes from this document, actually it's quite old, 1991, when a group of Jewish, Jews and Christians got together and, uh, and created out of this Institute on Religion and Public Life, uh, named after Paul Ramsey, a Methodist ethicist, uh, the Ramsey Colloquium. And uh, it's a pretty good way for us to, uh, to summarize what we studied last week. If you, I'm not going to read the whole document, but I'm going to breeze through it. Second paragraph, in relating to the sick, the suffering, the incompetent, the disabled, and the dying, we must learn again the wisdom that teaches us always to care, never to kill. Although it may sometimes appear to be an act of compassion, Killing is never a means of caring. So that, that concept is built in uh, to this uh, CTCR document. And then it goes on uh, to bring up two things uh, in the, the large paragraph at the bottom of the first page. Medical treatments can be refused or withheld if they are either useless or excessively burdensome. Th that phrase is going to repeat itself over and over tonight. So just as last week the phrase always to care never to kill repeated itself over and over, tonight's buzzword is uh, treatment can be refused or withheld if they're either useless or excessively burdensome. And we'll define that. We'll show you illustrations of what that means. No one should be subjected, still reading in that paragraph, no one should be subjected to useless treatment. No one need accept any and all life-saving treatments, no matter how burdensome. In making such decisions, the judgment is about the worth of treatments, not about the worth of lives. Worth of lives is always way up here. Life has dignity in God, okay? What we're talking about here is the worth of the treatment. When we ask whether a treatment is useless, the question is, Will this treatment be useful for this patient? Will it benefit the life he or she has? When we ask whether a treatment is burdensome, the question is, is this treatment excessively burdensome to the life of this patient? The question is not whether this life is useless, no. Not whether this life is burdensome. You know, for, for some people who don't know Christ, and they face these end-of-life decisions, that they, they have come to the conclusion that this person's life is useless. No, a person, as long as, as, long as he, is, he or she is still with us, is a child of God, okay? So our decisions, whether for or against a specific treatment, are to be always in the service of life. We are pro-life. We are Lutherans for life. You got that? We can and should allow the dying to die, 
We must never intend the death of the living. We may reject a treatment, but we never reject a life. That's quite a, that's quite a paragraph. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the rest of this document, uh, and, and it speaks to euthanasia, which we covered plenty good last week. Uh, in the middle of page two, then, it starts with four types of wisdom. Religious wisdom, moral wisdom, and then on page three, uh, political wisdom and four institutional wisdom uh, with the conclusion down at the bottom of page three this fourfold wisdom can be rejected only at our moral peril by attending to these sources of wisdom we find our way back to a firmer understanding of the limits of human responsibility and of the imperative to embrace compassionately those who suffer from illness and the fears associated with the end of life. Guided by this wisdom, we will not presume to eliminate a fellow human being, nor need we fear being abandoned in our suffering. Uh, that's a wonderful sentence there. Guided by this wisdom, we will not presume to eliminate a fellow human being, that's killing, nor need we fear being abandoned in our suffering, that's caring. Okay. The compact of rights, duties, and mutual trust that makes human community possible depends upon our continued adherence to the principle always to care, never to kill. And then on page four, you have uh, who, who uh, sat down together back in 1991 and created this document, which I, I commend to you, and which this CTCR document quotes over and over and over, quotes the Ramsey uh, Colloquium. And uh, the, the, the main name I want you to understand there is, uh, is uh, where is he? Gilbert Mylander. Gilbert Mylander, uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, expert on ethics. And again, I commend to you his book. If you really want to read further on this whole topic, uh, he's got two or three subsequent books, but his original one, which is now in the fourth printing, it's used by Christians, all denominations. Bioethics, a primer, primer, primer for Christians. Uh, Amazon, I don't know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks, something like that. And uh, it's, it's, uh, ref it's referenced in many of the footnotes here of the, doc doc the document also. All right, uh, to uh, just get our get our ramps uh, get our car going down the uh, ramp that we want to go tonight uh, on this uh, section 3 in uh, the table of contents I would have you turn to page 12 then turn to page 12 in the documents we we did cover this quickly at the end of uh, last week's session and uh, and and you know we were faced as we looked at culture and we, we looked at how uh, culture has changed, there's an appendix back there, you know, that we looked through that brings us all the way up to 2021. Uh, all, all the change in culture has been driven by two things. Number one, excessive uh, individuality. People ha want to do their own thing. It's the heart of the sin in the Garden of Eden. You don't want to be like, you don't want to uh, be ruled by a creator God. You eat the fruit from that tree and you can be like God. Uh, and that whole business about sinful pride, and uh, in Latin it's in curvatus se, that means you curve in on yourself. You make all decisions uh, uh, you know, like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, you know, it, it, by the way, you know that it wasn't an apple tree. You know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 wasn't the, it wasn't the apple tree. It was the pear underneath. Pear, you get it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Or, uh, anyway, I, I, I shouldn't <laughs> go back to my 40-year-old jokes. Um, in Curvatus essay, it was, uh, you know, and the, what's happened here, particularly 
uh, you know, I'll blame it on my, in the, on the 60s, you know, the hippie generation, the, uh, the demise of uh, respect for institutions, although now I don't know whether, how much respect we should have for institutions, but, but uh, the, the point is, uh, it's all free choice now, free choice, you know. Don't take away a woman's uh, reproductive uh, choices, you know. Don't, uh, you know, it, it's just all over our society. Individual determination, excessive individuality. And then the second thing that comes clashing right upon that move in culture is, uh, is the emotional desire to, re to, to consider all suffering evil. And, and therefore, we need to put them out of their misery, that kind of cavalier activity that, that they're old and they've lived a good life and, uh, you know, we're going to end it. Physician-assisted suicide. Uh, or I, wanna, I, want, I want to make that decision on my own. And so you have these uh, bad, bad understanding of, of suffering and, and Lord knows that came from sin also. You know, the Lord didn't, didn't in, intend in his original creation for there to be suffering. Uh, but now in the sweat of your brow you shall work, Adam. And uh, woman, you're going to have pain in childbearing. And, you know, we have a whole beautiful 66 books of the Bible to teach us about human suffering. Read Job. Read, uh, you know, read... The, the spirit of Christ when he came upon a people who were suffering and he had compassion on them. We have, we have St. Paul writing amazing promises that I can't compare the suffering of this life which, with the glory that is to be revealed. And we have to understand, number one, that God didn't, doesn't intend for us to suffer. He made, us, he, he made life perfect in the beginning. He didn't intend for us to die either, by the way, but he took care of that one too. Because uh, he promised there, in the day that, you know, if you believe in me, you will never die. You know, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I told that to a wonderful old German man in my first congregation. I said, uh, Otto, I'm never going to die. He, you know, I said to him, I'm not going to die. And he's, oh, pastor, we're all going to die. I said, no, I'm not going to die. You know, I'm going to exhale my last breath here on earth and take my next inhale up in heaven. But I'm not dying. The Lord promised me that. You're not going to die. The body will. Uh, this body, by the way, is well on its way. Okay? It's well on its way. I can tell you parts of it that are already dead. Now, now don't. My left ear, okay? My left ear is already dead. Okay, okay. But, uh, so suffering. Yeah, God doesn't send it to us. God, God doesn't just allow it either. I hate that phrase. Well, God allows us to suffer. Yeah, I know there's passages in the Bible that seem to indicate that, that you know, he does, you know, Paul prayed three times or pray, prayed over and over for a, th a thorn in the flesh to be removed and the Lord said no, no as though he was allowing it but no, even there it, it's not allow in the sense of God's up in his lazy boy in heaven ignoring what you're going through you know, he does not ignore what you're going through he's right in the middle of it working good, yeah that's another promise from Romans 8 all things work together for good to those who love his appearing. So this whole theology of suffering has got to come. And obviously the theology about death has got to come into play. But above all, uh, on page 12, uh, let's look at the first, second, and third, the last three paragraphs. Christians affirm the qualitative distinction between creator and creation. As creator, God does not cede his rights to the creation. He retains them. Yeah. Remember the, the watchmaker I told you last week, the Swiss watchmaker, Rolex or whatever? You know, he does amazing things creating it, puts it in a box, and it gets shipped to some jeweler in New York, and he never sees it again. That's not the way it is with God's creation. He, Luther's explanation 
It shows all the way in which he still preserves us. He nurtures us. He gives us what we need for life. He protects us and defends us and guards us from all evil. He's, he ties himself to his eternity. The doctrine of divine ownership, critical importance, means that he is still the creator. He still owns us. Okay, And that's a great comfort. Okay, uh, let alone, of course, and I didn't re refer to this one, you know, from the First Corinthians six, you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Christian doctrine insists that all ide ideologies, uh, all other ideologies, fail to grasp the central truth of existence that there is an infinite qualitative distinction between creation and creator. So, first article stuff. Okay, second. The reality of our creaturely, creatureliness includes an inescapable communal element. God looked at Adam when he had formed him from the dust and the, of the earth and said, Ooh, it is not good. He is alone. He created a woman, a relationship. He created family, okay? Uh, Mylander, in his book, recounts the lesson he learned from one of his students when discussing suicide. She, quote, described her cousin's suicide and its continuing effects on his family by saying, he didn't just take his own life, he took part of theirs too. We are never able to escape the importance of the existential question, am I my brother's keeper? Of course you are. Okay, We are living in relationship to one another. God did not intend us to be alone. That's, you know, I, I'm... Well, I have preached a whole sermon on that. Don't need to hear it again. Third, Scripture repeatedly affirms that not only does God retain the rights to our life, but he determines the number of our days. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them, before we were even born. Not only is God infinitely higher than we are, not only are we thrown into community with all of its joys and messy obligations, and we'll talk about some of those messy, uh, you know, am I my brother's keeper stuff later tonight, but even the length of our sojourn on this planet remains properly with the one who is not only creator but also sustainer. My ways are not your ways, so uh, that, 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 that's a nice summary of... Uh, uh, you know, and I wish they would have included way back on uh, page 8, down at the bottom paragraph, he brought in the way in which Jesus Christ became our brother and what that means for, for life, you know, when you're lying there in hospice. You're lying there with Jesus, 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 everything's Jesus. All right, uh, so we spent a lot of time on uh, page 13 now. We spent a lot of time on uh, euthanasia. We're not going to talk much about that anymore. Euthanasia is a sin. It, it, while the word means beautiful death, it is, uh, you know, physician-assisted suicide or, uh, you know, putting... putting uh, doing what we do with our pets when we say, you know what, uh, it's time to put Max down. Yeah, no, that we're not talking that language for a, a living soul of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, however, that gets us into tough stuff. Uh, the last sentence on... Uh, the second paragraph. There's a difference between enabling death and accepting its in inevitability. Okay? Deeply embedded in our moral and medical tradition is the distinction between allowing to die on the one hand and killing on the other. Now, the question gets complicated, especially with all the medical advancements that we have today. Uh, we'll skip over Netherlands, uh, that whole paragraph, because they've gone, that country has gone totally towards uh, ending life, uh, 
killing, killing at the end of life. Uh, and uh, you, you can read that yourself. And then, uh, you know, I, I mentioned last week, and it's the footnote uh, down at the bottom of page 13, footnote number 76, 75, 76, 77, 78. It all comes from, uh, from Neil Gorsuch, who uh, before he was ever a Supreme Court justice, which he is now uh, over the last, what, what's it been, a couple years? Uh, three, four, maybe four years. Uh, he wrote, wrote a lot on this topic, and we'll discuss some of the legal implications uh, along the way. Let's see. Maybe one more piece of summary before we get into our topic for tonight, and that's on page 14, then, the last paragraph. Mylander, again, that's uh, our good friend Gilbert. If you weren't here last week, many of you knew him even, perhaps, when he was a professor at Oberlin. He also was a pastor uh, at Grace Lutheran in Oberlin. And then he went to Valparaiso and held a distinguished chair uh, on ethics at Valparaiso. And he is the uh, brother-in-law of Jerry Young, uh, Pastor Young's wife. Uh, his, her sister married Gil Mylander. I, I believe he's retired now, but still, still very active in the whole role of uh, medical, ethical, bio, bioethics. Okay, Mylander has provided a strong defense of the rejection of euthanasia. With respect to euthanasia, he offers four simple ob observations. First, physicians are obligated to do what they can to relieve the suffering of their patients. Uh, here the can must be limited to morally can relieve the suffering. A physician would be prohibited from doing something that would relieve suffering but violate a moral code or, you know, a legal code even. Second, here's the more important one for us. That first one is for doctors. It'd be tough to be a doctor these days, you know, in this whole matter. Second, refusing to approve actions that are intended to kill the patient does not imply that we must do everything possible to keep the person alive. Okay? We will really delve into that tonight. It is sound medicine and morally appropriate to refuse treatments, and here, here comes these two words again, if they are useless or excessively burdensome. We'll put, we'll put meat on those bones tonight. Third, the freedom to order one's own life is not absolute. Yeah, we don't have self-determination. We can't marry our sister. <laughs> we can't sell one of our kidneys to the highest bidder. We can't take certain drugs. Okay? So we got lots of things that, that chain down our total freedom. So we don't have, you know, ex excessive individualism. You can't. And fourth, genuine compassion must respect the boundaries established by the creator-creature divide. So uh, we don't have ultimate authority over our own life uh, or over uh, one another. We, we don't give that authority to one another either. All right. Any comments out from the field there? Uh, otherwise, tonight we start on page 15. That's all by way of review. Uh, maybe, by the way, I, I'll get your, uh, your opinion before we get started. Well, I've already used an hour, a half hour. Okay. And I think it'll be a mute point. I thought there was a possibility that I could completely finish this document tonight and we would cancel next week. Uh, but I don't think at this point what that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right here we go uh is there is there sometimes an appropriate time to stop the use of such artificial means for prolonging a physical life and who should make those decisions patients their families their doctors what about advanced directives are they absolute many many questions the first paragraph says so let's take uh Let's take uh, half a dozen of these issues and uh, give them some thought. 
First of all, ventilators. Pull in the plug. Uh, my most, I, I've, I've been with families maybe four or five times, but I remember, I'll never forget the first one. It was when I was a pastor in Napoleon, and, uh, and the, it, the decision came to the family whether they, or not they wanted to keep their loved one on a ventilator, on artificial respiration, because uh, all other parts of their body, including two brain scans 24 hours apart and two separate doctors giving independent decisions and and lots of conversation that 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 you know led them and myself standing there as their young pastor not having a clue what I was doing there um, inadequacy of just trying to be there for them of pulling the plug of stopping the ventilator and in that case it took about 20 minutes but that was the end uh, these are not easy decisions these are tough I don't know if any of you have been uh, at the bedside or making those decisions but uh, let's look at the first let's look at the material here first and then I'll talk some more if a respirator or ventilator can be a bridge back to life, then we have the obligation to try it. If, on the other hand, the respirator is used when death is inevitable, simply to slow the dying process, then it is wrongfully keeping us from being released to be with God. Uh, Elizabeth Skogland um, quoted in Bartlett's uh, ven Ventilator Feeding Tubes and Other End-of-Life Decisions, that book. So we come upon now that whole matter of DNR. And uh, you've heard it, and maybe some of you have it in your advanced directives. Uh, oftentimes, even when you're admitted to the hospital, uh, given the right circumstances, they will ask about your loved one or your... Uh, you know who you're res responding there with, whether or not they you, you want a DNR. Now, that is not necessarily the same thing. And by the way, also, uh, it's not the same thing as a heart lung machine. Okay, heart lung machine is uh, what, what what I was on for six hours, seven hours, whatever, during bypass surgery. Okay. And uh, I'm glad they didn't pull the plug, <laughs> Susie. <laughs> My wife's out of the house for one of the first times in I don't know how long. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, so a ventilator is, uh, I, mean, I, actually, I actually got a full definition of what a ventilator is here. It's a life support treatment that helps people breathe when they are unable to breathe on their own. Depending on a patient's medical condition, a ventilator, uh, sometimes referred to as a respirator or breathing machine, can support or complete, uh, completely control breathing for a short period of time or long term. With conventional mechanical ventilation, a patient is connected to a ventilator through a tube in the mouth or in the neck. Uh, and it goes on to talk. And then... Uh, you know, and then they show the, the difference between that and a heart-lung machine, which is really uh, keeping the heart pumping, not pumping, but the blood moving through the lungs while the heart is stopped for the sake of surgeries. So this is, that's medical technology. It was unheard of, you know, uh, 50 years ago. Okay, so let's look here at DNR. Uh, First, the paragraph in the middle of the page. Uh, DNR orders often involve the use of the issue of ventilators. A DNR designation refers to a medical order making clear an individual's request that, quote, no measures be taken to resuscitate him if his heart or breathing stops. The order is made while the individual is mentally capable and conscious or by his health care proxy if he is not. We'll talk about what the difference is there in a moment. 
DNR covers a wide range of specific instructions. Some patients may choose to have full code with intubation and to be placed on a ventilator. Another patient may decide not to be on a ventilator with a DNR select code status, where the heart would be shocked if it stops, but intubation and ventilation is not performed. Do you understand the difference there? Okay. So the, you know, a, 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 you could have a DNR that is only after the heart. Uh, uh, it, it cannot be paddled anymore. Okay. But if, if they can get the heart going again, that's a whole other issue. Uh, a third option involves a patient that chooses to have the status of do not resuscitate. Various treatments, antibiotics, tube feeding, and other care preferences can be specified on some DNR forms. In some jurisdictions, uh, some states, and the, the law differs from state to state, to guide health team members. As for medically assisted nutrition and hydration, Luther's words are on point when he reminds us in the small catechism that we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor and his body, but help and support him in every physical need. Uh, if you see anyone, I'm skipping the large catechism there, if you see, last sentence, if you see anyone who is suffering from hunger and do not feed her, you have let her starve. Even in a state of coma, patients are often aware of their surroundings and conversations that take place. Yeah, I've, I believe that totally. I was taught in the seminary, and I thank God for it, because it's, uh, there's many times when I have said, when loved ones start talking in the room, the hospital room or the nursing care room, start talking about things that they shouldn't be talking about in the presence of the loved ones who's in a coma, I say, get out in the hallway. Uh, because, uh, 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 well, uh, is the last yeah, Joni Erickson's book, you know, uh, shows some illustrations of how, well, I think we're going to come upon one here in the book, too. Patients are not blind. They see the offering or non-offering of appropriate food and liquid. Da, da, da. Tube feeding should never be deemed useless or futile if it sustains life and prevents death by starvation or hydration. Now there's going to be a yes but that's coming yet, okay? So this is not an absolute statement about tube feeding. Since a patient's life is God-given, we will not deem a treatment futile that sustains life, even though we might all agree it's not the life that anybody would choose for themselves. Yeah, sure, okay, well, we don't want to suffer. Um, We'll skip the next paragraph, but here. One might reasonably ask if ever removing, so I'm on the th third full paragraph, or, ever removing artificial nutrition and hydration uh, pr represents a per permissible act. Here the question revolves around whether one is allowing a person to die or is intending to cause death. This paper, uh, that's a crucial question there. This paper affirms the principle that withholding or withdrawing treatments may be done when it becomes, here comes our points, useless or excessively burdensome. Now, when could feeding, when could tubes become excessively burdensome? Well, here comes the answer. If the kidneys no longer process fluids for elimination, Adding fluids artificially may result in edema, swelling, additional pain, burdensome. Yet we are reminded that the burdensomeness is that of the treatment, not of the life itself. We are called to care for other persons and do all we can to reasonably, that's a tough one, do to assist in, in, in sustaining their lives. And uh, that, uh, did I skip over the one where, about feeding? Because that also, when the body can no longer process it. Uh, That's the next paragraph. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Anyway, Mylander, okay, so about four sentences up from the bottom. Mylander correctly notes that such care cannot be described as useless since it preserves the life of an embodied human being. 
Uh, to withdraw or withhold nutrition and hydration from a person means certain death. Regardless of our mo motives, we would be aiming at the death of the person. No, 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 no. Sensitive ethicists, such as Mylander, conclude, for the permanently unconscious person, feeding is neither useless nor excessively burdensome. Is it, it is ordinary human care and is not given as treatment for any life-threatening disease. Since this is true, a decision not to offer such care can enact only one intention, to take the life of an unconscious person. Uh, there's another state, uh, there's another clearer statement somewhere in here though uh, about uh, not only hydration but feeding when, when it becomes burdensome, okay? Tough questions, tough questions. Even tougher when we go to the next question, who decides? The annals of medical ethics are full of accounts of debates over who should be the decider. The popularity of living wills, a topic we will consider in the next section, is in large part a reaction to the fear of physicians imposing their own values. Some doctors will err on the side of determining the patient is a lost cause. Others will opt for every treatment conceivable, whether it's prudent or not. Complicating the scene, we have questions regarding whether physicians may ethically object to performing particular procedures, even against their conscience or religious belief. Um, most people probably agree that patients are not obligated to submit themselves to every recommendation by a physician, even their own, nor are doctors required to follow bad medicine. We would want patients and their physicians to discuss and deliberate on the procedure for treatment this should include a candid, candid uh, disclosure of the potential risks. But does this approach resolve the dilemma? Nope, that's why advanced directives have become popular and even almost required. A rather simplistic resolution to a difficult problem. The solution is that a patient alone decides on the care to be received. Given this assumption, a further question is how a patient is to be treated if he is no longer capable of decision making. So write it down in advance. The most common of the advanced directives is a so-called living will. In a living will, a hypothetical patient, let's say Mary, expresses the kind of care that she would want as she contemplates life's end. This ignores the fact that patients eventually face an all too real end of life that is not hip, 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 uh, uh, hypothetical at all. Indeed, there's a real question whether Mary, who articulated her preferences two decades ago in a living will, would agree with him today. In order to address the deficiencies of substituted judgment and living wills, many ethicists opt for the designation of a legal proxy to act in the best interests of the person. In various forms, the durable power of attorney for health care uh, is uh, suggested by this document and by Mylander to be a much better choice. Let me read from Mylander's book. A living will lets others off the hook too easily. Patients who are unable to make decisions for themselves because, for example, they are severely demented or permanently unconscious have, in a sense, become strangers to the rest of us. We see in them what we may one day be. They make us uneasy and we react with ambivalence. No matter how devoted our care or our uneasiness with a loved one who has become a stranger to us, may prompt us to do less than we ought to sustain his life. It is important, therefore, to structure the medical decision-making situation in such a way that conversation is forced among the doctor, other caregivers, the patient's family, the pastor, or priest. Advanced directives, often with the force of legal recognition standing behind them, are designated to eliminate the need for such conversation. That is part of their problem, for they free us from the need to deal 
with the ambivalence we feel in caring for a loved one who has now become a burdensome stranger. Uh, just hang with me. I realize, of course, that freeing loved ones from such burdens is supposed to be one of the benefits of the living will, but Christians ought to be wary of such language, for to burden one another is, in large measure, what it means to belong to a family and to the new family in which we are brought in baptism. Uh, by the way, he, he wrote an article uh, in 1991, same year that the Ramsey Coll Colloquium was written, called, I Want to Burden My Loved Ones. <laughs> Families would not have the significance they do for us if they did not, in fact, give us a claim upon each other. At least in this sphere of life, we do not come together as autonomous individuals, freely contracting with each other. We simply find ourselves thrown together and asked to share the burdens of life while learning to care for one another. I think, therefore, that we ought to prefer the health care power of attorney to the living will. It, too, of course, reaches out into a future beyond the limits of our competence, but it does so in a way that recognizes and affirms dependence. It anticipates and accepts that others will have to bear some burdens for us as we would for them. To medical caregivers, it says simply, here is a person upon whom I have often been dependent for love and care in the past. Now, when I can no longer participate in decisions about my medical care, I am content to continue to be dependent upon their love and care. Talk with them about what is best for me. In our cultural circumstances in which we find ourselves, I do not think Christians can do better than this. Sue? Yeah. Well, I would say it was most unusual that a complete stranger to you would have named you. Do you know, it, it, the reason it happened was because I was at the Lincoln home and somebody said, oh, we have several people here who have no power of attorneys. And they had no family. And, you know, you have no idea how that happens. Mm -hmm. But I was a trusted person. Jack was on the board. Yeah. And they needed somebody to take this responsibility. Yeah. All right, and uh, again, my apologies from last week. I know you couldn't hear Sue, but what she's talking about is uh, it may not be mom or dad or your cousin that names you as a power of attorney for health care decisions. It may be someone uh, who you don't know that well. If you are that person, uh, then you need to take that role seriously, is what Sue is saying. Okay? Any other comments about uh, issues like this and decisions, ev recommendations even, or um, words that your lawyers have used to talk to you about the difference between living wills and durable health care powers of attorney? Larry?
the ideal situation, of course, would be that over prayer and, uh, and healthy conversation, you and whoever you're uh, designating to be your power of attorney for health care decisions have talked about these issues. And you're well aware that as you have been dependent upon this person for love and care during your healthy days, you will also be confident that they will use the same love and care when you are not able to bank your decisions. So it, it, yeah, yeah. And the questions to ask, uh, and here's my durable power of attorney for health care, uh, the questions to ask can also be addressed in it with respect to uh, DNRs and um, and uh, hydration and comfort care and so on and so forth. So that's part of the document itself. And, but it's because you've already talked about it uh, and you during the time in which you know you're putting the end of life decisions together. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're we're learning more and more what's needed now, right? Over here. That's another issue, by the way. But who who will be your power of attorney? Yeah, but there is also a friend in Columbus. It, by the way, it may not be the person who is your financial power of attorney. thing, you know, that this should tell us all. If you did a living will uh, 30 years ago, might not hurt for you to take a look at it again. <laughs> you know, up, update these documents. Keep these documents updated. Attorneys recommend that, yeah. 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 All right. Again, I'm, I'm sorry I'll try to repeat the conversation we're talking about here. Yes, Sue. Yeah. And that you know that's something you don't even think about. Yep. Especially as they get older, they don't hear things, they don't remember things, and the other thing to remember is when somebody's in the hospital and the doctors are talking to them, they have no clue what they're saying if they've just come out of anesthetic. Or they don't have the right information. Or they don't have the right information, right? That's tricky. That's tricky. Blame it on the hearing aids. <laughs> okay, so the, the conversation uh, in the last moment here has been, you know, if you are a uh, proxy for health care decisions, then also keep yourself informed about their medical condition, uh, you know, as they, as they doctor in their later years. 
A uh, lot of stuff on pages 18 and 19, most of which will, will lead to the same encouragement that, that durable health care uh, powers of attorney are preferable to living wills. Uh, not that living wills are not uh, helpful. As a matter of fact, they, there's just a huge uh, escalation. If you go down to the bottom of page 19, the last uh, full paragraph, it, you have Mylanders there. Uh, bluntly says, I want to burden my loved ones. The desire to spare family members at the time of death. Mylander summarizes his comments he has heard frequently in seminars. I'm afraid that if my children have to make decisions about my care, they won't be able to handle the pressure. They'll just argue with each other. They'll feel guilty, wondering whether they're really doing what I would want. I don't want to be a burden to them. I'll do whatever I can in advance to see that I'm not. Those who have served in pastoral ministries or in institutions caring for the elderly will recognize the sentiment, Mylander repeats. Not all families are intact or cooperative or even particularly stable. Dying seniors may have one or more strange children with whom they have not spoken in years. Sometimes the relationship between the children will become the crux of the dissension. The end-of-life crisis facing an aging mother or father will exasperate, exasperate existing sibling issues that have never been resolved satisfactorily. At times, a child may question or mistrust a parent's decision-making on behalf of another parent. Would it not be better to prevent such conflict and relieve the burden of decision-making by simply drafting a living will that states what you want for end of life? Mylander rejects that assumption that a family should be spared such burdens. To be a family is to bear one another's burden. It's not in large measure what it means to belong to a family, to burden each other, and to find almost miraculously that other, others are willing, even happy, to carry such burdens. Families uh, would not have the significance they do for us if they did not, in fact, give us claim upon each other. So, the logic of living wills elevates personal autonomy and self-determination above any other ethical values. But if dying people nearing the end of life demonstrate anything, it is that they are neither autonomous nor self-determining whether attended to by physicians, nurses, or willing family caregivers, the wishes and needs of a person at the threshold of death may be quite different from those that were anticipated perhaps decades earlier while one was a vigorous person. So uh, you have the rest of that there. And uh, some more things down at the bottom from Mylander's book are quoted here in this uh, section of the paper. We can go to page 22 if you're ready. Any more comments on uh, living wills and advanced directives for power of attorney? <clears throat> I think all of us are uh, interested in uh, these next two topics. The question of when enough is enough, and we come back now to that same old phrase, when is a treatment useless, when is a treatment excessively burdensome? A commitment to the sanctity of life and a refusal to accept physician-assisted suicide does not involve an idealistic effort to sustain bio biological life at all costs. When all indications point to God calling the soul from the body, and you know that's really what eternal life is all about. That's why Jesus could say, if you believe in me, you're never going to die. Because in that moment when the body dies, the soul is with Christ. Okay. There is no point in merely blowing wind through the empty tent with ventilators and machines. When death appears imminent, the decision to withhold or withdraw food and hydration is not deciding to kill. Rather, it represents an important aspect of caring for dying persons. 
We do not wish to add burdens, but to relieve him of additional burdens. Okay, now here are some illustrations then, and here's what, what I was looking for earlier about the food even. While it may be appropriate to withdraw or withhold nutrition and hydration for someone who is imminently dying, that does not mean that we may act in this way because a patient is not dying fast enough. Yeah. That's real. That's a real issue. I've sat with many, many families and, and you know, myself with my own mother where our prayers quit being for healing and was, come on, Lord, take her. Uh, that's, not, that's not a sinful prayer for death. It's a glorious prayer for resurrection, for eternity. Uh, and, and, of course, we Christians are the only, one, are the only ones who have that power. That the faith that sustains that kind of an attitude. Amen. As fallible men and women with deceitful hearts, it is easy to deceive ourselves with faulty reasons for why we should hasten death. Hospital and skilled nursing facility nurses have all heard families use a patient's poor quality of life as a reason to suspend treatments. So let's just get away from this idea of, of that's why we're doing it. If we're doing it to kill a person, it's wrong. If we're doing it to s care for a person, it's right. Might be the same action, but it's the attitude behind it that is key and that we have to pray for wisdom. We acknowledge, uh, uh, go ahead, Rita. Yeah, well, that's the other side of this horrible coin. You know, one is to try to extend biological life way beyond what's natural. Yeah. yeah. And the other, of course, is to kill. Despite suspicious re reasoning, we acknowledge that there are times when it's inappropriate to provide nutrition and hydration. Depending upon the specific condition, here it is. When major organs begin to fail, nutrition and hydration may actually increase the discomfort of body experiences after it no longer accepts or processes such sustenance effectively. In the active stages of dying, deterioration of the di digestive tract can lead to discomfort and bloating. Similarly, as the heart becomes weaker and less efficient in pumping blood, fluid overload creates negative conditions including fluid backup in the lungs, respiratory distress, and excessive swelling of the tissues. There's the paragraph that you know presents the you know what's useless and what's excessive when it comes to hydration and nurture. Um, there's the uh, bullet points are just undermining the same thing we talked about there. Refusing or withdrawing treatment, E. In discussing the ethics of refusing treatment, several authors cite a helpful metaphor known as the good host. I like, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. I don't think it's real helpful, but it's interesting. Uh, an Anglican came up with it. A couple invite friends to dinner. Food and drink are pleasant, conversation bubbles. The good host is hospitable and courteous to his guest, no matter what his, shift, what his shifts in mood. But there comes a time when the party winds down, a time to acknowledge that the evening is over. At that point, not easily determined by clock conversation or basal meta, 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 metabolism, the good host does not press his guest to stay, but lets him go. Indeed, he may have to signal 
that it is acceptable to leave, you know, like walk down with your pajamas on or something. <laughs> a good host will never be sure of his timing and will never kick out his guests. His jurisdiction over the guest is limited to taking care and permitting departure. Okay, I, I don't really like that, but it's cute, I thought. Uh, it doesn't belong in a Commission on Theology and Church Relations document. <laughs> But, but the point of the uh, two sentences later says, the good host neither pushes his guests out the door too early, nor does he invade them upon them to remain after the end of the party. You know, let them go. Let them go. How many times have we heard people say of dying Christian loved ones, let them go. As a matter of fact, I said last week, some of the miracles of the end of life are that people have finally said to their loved one while they could still hear, it's okay, you don't have to fight anymore. I give you permission to go. That's a beautiful thought uh, and a wonderful comfort, I think. Uh, all right, so um, next one we come to at the bottom of this page, 23, is morphine. Many end-of-life treatments to reduce pain will carry negative, even possible, possibly lethal side effects. The narcotic morphine, for example, has become a commonly prescribed end-of-life medication to relieve severe pain that does not respond to other analgesics. As the patient's pain increases, caregivers typically administer larger doses of the drug. Morphine not only deadens pain, it also suppresses respiration. The aim of the treatment, however, intends to mitigate pain and not to cause death. If a caregiver deliberately overdoses the patient in order to euthanize him, we would say that he killed him since death was the, patient, the physician's aim or the caregiver's aim. If, however, carefully adjusted doses of morphine to relieve pain do, in fact, suppress respiration and the patient dies, we would not reach the same determination since death was not the intent. Do you see? The same thing comes again. Okay. It's the attitude. If I'm going to use this to hasten death, to kill this person, to put them out of their misery, okay, that's one thing. If caring for the person, you want to relieve their suffering, that's a whole other issue. The treatment may be refused if it is useless for the person to relieve his condition um, uh, 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 excessive burdensome uh, number one yeah, is useless number two second treatments can become excessively burdensome because life is not our God we are not doing it okay so refusing here we go uh, middle, almost the middle of the page last sentence of the paragraph elderly cancer patients for instance may choose not to accept the recommended chemotherapy because of the burden of side effects. And that is uh, probably the best example of not, uh, of, of refusing treatment. Many people who are going through treatment after treatment after treatment for cancer say, enough. I'm sick of being sick. No more treatment. Okay. And that's not considered killing. It's a, a, it's a part of caring. Right? Can it be abused? Why, sure it can. Okay. So th these, this is not easy. None of this is easy. Okay. But it's a, it's a, sp the spirit that flows behind the decision, the prayer and thought that's given to it, and to make just grab a hold of these phrases: Is it useless? Is it uh, excessively burdened? Burdensome, uh, excessively burdensome. I should we should read that paragraph right in the middle of the page. A variety of medical procedures, treatments, and even medications 
may prolong life but add an unwanted, unwarranted burden. The patient chooses life, not death, simply not the life promised by the particular medical treatment. And then the elderly patients. Um, I put down a note by uh, footnote number 124. Not only medical caregivers, but also family members may sometimes be authorized to administer morphine. It would be vital in such cases that there be instructions in the proper way to do so, as well as counsel concerning the distinction between caring and killing. Caring and killing. You can use morphine. God, it's a wonderful drug at the end of life. But it can also kill a person. Okay, so. Interesting. And uh, it is true that, uh, you know, family members are sometimes, I, uh, I'll make a long story short. Uh, I have an, my mother's sister, an aunt, who uh, lived in San Diego, California all of her life uh, after she moved away from Blue Earth, Minnesota. And uh, I got a registered, registered letter in the mail, one of the, you know, where it says, come to the post office and sign for it. And I went to pick it up. This is years ago. And I went to pick it up, and I got home, and there was a check for $10,000 from Aunt Carol. And it said, you can use this for anything you want, but I want you to, uh, I want you to come to San Diego and do my funeral when I die. <laughs> well, I called her that very day, and I said, Aunt Carol, this is crazy. I, number one, who knows if I'm going to live longer than, if you're going to live longer than me. Number two, I don't need money to come to San Diego and do your funeral. And number three, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> and she was. She was fine. And we made a couple of trips out to San Diego on, on her dime uh, and had wonderful time with her. But then one day uh, we got a phone call and she said, and again, I'll keep this story short. I've got cancer, and, and I'm not going to do any more treatments. And so we said, uh, we'll be out. And we went out again. And, uh, and this time, she was dying. As a matter of fact, she was in hospice already. And uh, Susie gave her morphine uh, at the instruction of the hospice lady, you know, that came to her home. And... Uh, and uh, our plane, she was still alive. She had uh, some stepchildren who were wonderful to her that were still out in San Diego with her. And we entrusted her care to them after she had pretty much become unresponsive. And, uh, and we said goodbye to her. And I don't know if she was alert enough to know that, but our plane was ready to go. So we left. And by the time we got to the airport, her stepson said she died. So she must have died like half hour after we left the house. Anyway, we, we administered morphine. And uh, it was, these are all tough stuff, this tough stuff. I thank God that our church has put a document together that gives us some things to think about at least. Huh? Um, I think I'm going to skip financial matters we talked about that we talked about that a little bit last week you know in terms of uh, that not being a reason to stop care and try to kill I mean those are gross ways to put it right uh, you know we don't think mom would want to live like this you know physician-assisted suicide or unusual you know, uncaring treatment so that there's some of her estate left for her sister and me, my sister and me. Okay, so that should be, should be a no problem. Necessary, uh, page 26. Burdens of treatment versus burden of life. Earlier, we introduced the matter of medically useless or excessively burdensome treatments. Uh, there it is again. 
Along with most Christian ethicists, we affirm that no one should be subjected to a treatment that would be useless. But beyond this, no one need agree to every treatment proposed, regardless of how life-saving it may be, if the treatment is excessively burdensome. And here, cancer chemotherapy is, uh, is the most classic illustration of this may produce extremely difficult side effects, particularly for an, a very aged individual. And some patients may elect to spend time with family or friends rather than accepting the grueling course of chemotherapy with little possibility of extended life. Refusing a particular course of medical treatment because it's too burdensome on the patient is radically different from considering the very life of a dying person to be a burden. So it's not that the person is a burden, it's that the treatment is a burden. Any comments? And that's the useless part of the document. Okay. Yeah. And that's why, uh, and, and I don't know what the legality in Ohio now is, but, you know, two brain scans 24 hours apart used to be the norm in Ohio, because I was in Napoleon. Uh, and if the, if there is no no way for the brain to recover. I wouldn't it's useless. Yeah. Go to surgery if it had been yeah. Done. Yep. Nothing easy about any of that, right? No. Number two, caring, but only caring. And uh, here again, it's a fifth commandment kind of a thing. We have a responsibility to care for. Do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. The commitment always to care, never to kill, second, last paragraph, does not mean that we should eliminate all those who suffer or that we glibly ignore their suffering. Instead, it requires that we find efficacious ways to mitigate suffering. A Christian ethicist summarized the principle governing Christian compassion in realistic, not idealistic ways. In the name of Christ, we show compassion most when we maximize care not when we merely minimize suffering. Okay? Maximize care, not minimize suffering. We're going to have suffering in this world. You cannot, you know, you cannot just say, as soon as somebody is suffering, put them down. Okay? Care for them. Now, the caring might include, okay, decisions with respect to useless or excessively burdensome treatments and a refusal to do so. Number three, top of page 27. One may suffer from a condition the physician labels terminal without facing imminent death. Some prostate cancers may grow so slowly that eventually a different malady actually causes death. Doctors may then elect to treat such a cancer with benign neglect, since the consequence of the cures may be worse than the reasonable expectation of death in the near term. The fact remains that such a person has a terminal disease. Huh? However, that in and itself, of itself does not fix an expiration date on the person's life. Uh, you understand what that paragraph is saying? Other people are irretrievably dying and their body has begun to shut down. Family members may be advised that a vital organ has begun to malfunction in a life-threatening way. Often efforts to shore up the function of one organ, the heart, 
will create additional problems for another one, the kidneys. You want an example? Take a look at me. I have congestive heart failure. Fluid buildup around my heart. Nothing to do about it. It's a disease I simply live with. I'm on Lasix. The amount of Lasix to eliminate the fluid could destroy my kidneys. The balance, the constant monitoring of which is worse, your heart or your kidneys? Something I live with. I'm not afraid of it. Some forms of advanced disease may be so progressed that only hours or days remain. Someone who is irretrievably dying may find few treatments that can be called useful. Here the Christian duty of maximizing care comes into play. So, okay, a couple good paragraphs there. And here's this uh, motivation thing. Intention or aim of an action versus result of an action. We had uh, an illustration last week about a soldier who, uh, uh, we just had, what, the 70th anniversary of the uh, Normandy, the beach landing in Normandy? How many of those 18, 19, 20-year-olds got off those uh, carriers and were on a suicide mission? Okay? A distinction between a suicide mission and an act of suicide. The first does not aim at death, it is merely dueling one's duty as a soldier. The second intends to produce death. So you see again how the motivation is the key in this wrestling that we have to do with end of life stuff. Uh, they, they use another illustration, death by cop scenario. I don't know if the 20 year old who climbed up on that building at uh, set last Saturday to to shoot at the uh, President Trump if he did so so that he would get shot if that was his way of committing suicide I don't know. we don't know uh, and they get some other illustrations there here's another one down at the bottom we hear a lot about palliative care versus palliative sedation palliative care describes the treatment of the discomfort symptoms and stress of serious illness. Whether offered in a hospital or clinic, in hospice or at home, the goal aims at relief from problematic symptoms such as pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, constipation, nausea, loss of appetite, sleep difficulties, among others. Some palliative care seeks to mitigate the side effects of medical treatment, like chemotherapy. It holds forth the hope of improving the quality of life and reducing the distress of family members. Since unwelcome system, symptoms exist on a spectrum from easily remedied to most unmanageable, palliative sedation, as defined here, denotes the intentional lowering of awareness toward pain, perhaps even including unconsciousness. You know, when a person is severely burned What's one of the treatments? Make them unconscious. Okay. Uh, although being conscious and present to interact with family and friends remains a value for most people as they seek to near the end of life, for some the relief of symptoms may outweigh the desire to be conscious. Medically induced coma, is that what they call that? And it can be uh, quite controversial. I wrote down in the margin, halfway through that big paragraph, tough decision, tough decision. We might argue that surgeons render patients unconscious routinely during surgical procedures. Yeah, that's not, that's no problem. We call that, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, when it's more serious, it's another matter. Uh, these are all tough questions, aren't they? Six, treatments which may be refused versus care that should never be denied. 
I think we've covered that really quite well. It goes back again, second sentence, medically useless, excessively burdensome. And while treatments may be refused, care must never be denied. Care, care, care. Always. Always to care, never to kill. Top of page 29. Uh, lay use of the term vegetable for a person in a coma or vegetative state represents a horrible misinterpretation of the meaning of the medical term persistent vegetative state, PVS. While the word may be acceptable within the scope of its clinical use, the casual use of it may mislead people greatly. The term coma refers to the lack of both awareness and wakefulness, whether in an open-eyed or closed-eyed coma state. Patients in a vegetative state may have regained consciousness from a coma, but still have not regained awareness. PVS represents a disorder of consciousness in which patients with severe brain damage are in a state of partial arousal rather than true awareness. Typically, the classification of vegetative state gets applied to such persons in the first weeks with the classification of persistent vegetative state coming after four weeks. While some commonly prescribe those in a persistent vegetative state as brain dead, that is not correct. Uh, next paragraph, this is a, a stunner when I read this uh, earlier this week. PVS patients may sometimes regain full consciousness. One man, Conley Holbrook, was classified as comatose for eight years. 1991, he awoke, and according to uh, the book, Bartlett and Reader, that is quoted earlier in the document, get this. 26-year-old Holbrook was not only able to call each of his relatives by name. Now, get this. He was even able to identify the small children who had been born while he was unconscious. So once in a while it happens. So that's, that's one we have to be careful with. But uh, these are horrible. I have not, I have not, in my 52 years of pastoral ministry, been involved with one of these. But any of you? A permanently vegetative state? Yeah. I've had unconsciousness, but it's another matter. Hospice care, okay? This is a good one for us to close with tonight because it is, uh, it is such a blessing in my in my in my book we have such wonderful hospice ministries and they are really ministries here in northeast ohio whether it's hospice of the western reserve or lorraine county or there I, I can't name them all we've had a lot of our people in the congregation be blessed at the end of life with hospice care Inpatient or at home, valuable partner to both family and dying person. Why is it? Okay, here's where we're going to see why it's so valuable. Unlike restorative th therapies and procedures common in hospitals, hospice aims at palliative relief of pain and symptoms of a terminally ill patient. But here's the deal. Next paragraph, or next sentence. Hospice pro programs also incorporate attending to the emotional and spiritual needs of the patient. Note that the spiritual support provided by a secular organization that conceives of the idea spiritual in the most generic and ecumenical way will be sometimes quite different from pastoral care offered by a Lutheran clergyman. Well, uh, I'll broaden that a little bit. Uh, so m most of the hospice care that I've been involved with with the people here at St. Paul's the hospice caregivers themselves are very Christian, are very Christian. So it's not a watered-down, generic, ecumenical spirituality. Yes, uh, can the church and 
the pastors be an important part of that with respect to word and sacrament ministry? Of course they can. Yes, there is a, uh, a liturgy called Commendation of the Dying that is in our pastoral care companion. I've used it many times. Because of the focus on uh, palliation of a terminal, terminally ill patient, the priority falls on comfort and quality of life. Not only through the reduction of pain and suffering, but through the environment, just through the environment. Hospice will work like crazy if you want to try to stay at home, or if the only way to stay at home is to burden another elderly person who really can't lift or take care, then inpatient hospice is, you know, the rooms are beautiful, there's soft music, there's, uh, you know, whatever you want. There's it's there to create a home-like comfort kind of a situation. And it, we are, we are we're just plain blessed. Um, hospice, last, uh, hospice provides an alternative to therapies aimed at prolonging life through means of therapies and procedures. Current treatments for cancer, for instance, carry with them potentially uh, unwanted side effects, burden, uh, there it is, extremely burdensome, useless, okay? Uh, top of page 30, Medicare. At present, the United States Medicare program only covers hospice care if the hospice provided is Medicare approved. And one can determine if the hospice provider qualifies as Medi Medicare approved by inquiring with your physician the hospice provider, the state hospice organization, state health department, and again, this is different from state to state. Uh, if the hospice has been Medicare approved, original Medicare will cover everything you need related to your terminal illness. Current law permits two 90-day benefit periods followed by an unlimited number of 60-day periods. This includes the right to change hospice providers once during each provider period. Anybody? I don't know if that's true in Ohio. Anybody have any knowledge of Medicare coverage? I think that was a period of like a, huh? There used to be a shorter period of the thing. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, needless to say. There's a lot of people that have secondary coverage. Coverage. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, okay, that last paragraph I guess is a good way for us to close tonight. Patients are encouraged to become intelligent consumers of their usage of medical science and its myriad benefits. In the area of hospice, differences of a practical pain and symptom management exist. For example, some hospices may not perform glucose monitoring for diabetics as they see it as a treatment, toward, uh, a, a, as a cure, even though monitoring glucose could cause hypoglycemia. Uh, okay. So the, uh, actually I have, uh, I've put some documents over here. There's not enough for everybody. But there's one of them called questions to ask when you go into hospice. What should I ask hospice? There's another one. These are all from Lutherans for Life, our parent company for our ministry action team, Lutherans for Life, a Christian guide to end of life decisions, and another one here, going gracefully, going gracefully. And there's some other things from Lutherans for Life over here that you're welcome to take at the end of today. And then uh, about the last different hospice providers, just an inch or so from the bottom carry out their duties in many ways, some handling most of the care needs, other expecting family to a volunteer. Again, ask enough questions in advance. And uh, again, I have found that the hospice providers here in Northeast Ohio, we are so, so blessed. There, and on page 31, there's a bunch of questions for you to ask. And I know a lot of you have have dealt with hospice. And Rita, you were a hospice nurse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of our patients, one of our, our parishioners, um, when his spouse died, um, the hospice organization checked on him every month because they were very concerned about a man, especially not being able to deal with 
Now, that's why I call this a ministry. That hospice, even after death, uh, are concerned about the family members. Yeah, follow up. By the way, some of you may not know that our own Stephen Ministry here at St. Paul Lutheran Church uh, offers grief counseling books uh, uh, every quarter for the year after someone dies to the family members. A wonderful ministry here at St. Paul's. Yeah. Well, two things. Number one, my husband passed away in April, and I've gotten the second booklet, and the booklets are wonderful. Oh, God bless you. Yeah. Came the other day, and I read through the next day. Yeah. Just wonderful. And hospice, I mean, my husband really was only in hospice for barely over 24 hours. And, I mean, they called me. They Yeah, Janice lost her husband just uh, three months ago. Yeah, and a, a testimony about hospice, that how wonderful it is. Um, I, I'm teetering whether to tell this silly story or not. I could tell it anonymously, but there's only three pastors here, so you'd, you'd be able to guess, I guess. So uh, this is some time ago, and I won't say who it was, but it's, we've lost a lot of wonderful people to the Lord this, this, this last year. Well, you know, Pastor went to visit one of our, Pastor Smith went to visit one of our, <laughs> one of our members at Ames Hospital hospice and uh, ministered to had a wonderful visit with the family and everything and then we text each other to let us know who's who's gone and who's made the visit and uh, and he wrote he wrote in the text uh, you know I went and saw them had a wonderful visit and uh, but I don't think death is imminent and that night the, the person died okay so uh, we joked that I'm glad you're a pastor, not a doctor. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I went to visit somebody. This is, you know, a couple months pass. And I went to visit somebody in hospice uh, at their home, in their home. And, uh, and I said, I don't think he's going to make it the weekend. And three weeks later, they're still alive. <laughs> And Smith texted me back and said, you're not a doctor either, are you? <laughs> yeah. and, and we've kind of got this going now. <laughs> so every time we visit somebody in hospice, we, we make a guess. We make a guess. But it's uh, oftentimes not, ca not the case. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's the deal. We got, we got a th another unit in this book to cover next week. I don't think it'll take us an hour and a half. I think uh, it's a sh much shorter unit. Uh, and maybe we'll have it easier to open up for other testimonies you guys have or questions you have. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I uh, will look forward to finishing up the document next week and hope it's been a blessing to you all. God bless you. Good night. Thank you.